Uh, let me just give a quick introduction. So I'll, I'll say welcome to the Bay Area Listen Team Users Group. We've been around for many years, but had a long hiatus after the pandemic. But now suddenly we have excellent speakers who are coming forward. And uh, today we're going to hear from Larry Messenger and a number of his colleagues on the Medley Interlist project. So uh, I think I will not say anything more about it because they have plenty to say and I'm much less interesting. So Larry, take it away. I'm Larry Besinter. I'm going to talk to you about the Medley Interlist project. I worked on Interlist from about 1973 uh, until 86, but stayed on with the Commonwealth Standards Group for a number of years after that. And uh, everything that you hate about Common List is on my phone. Because I was trying to leave room for Interlist to turn into a Common List implementation. I spent 25 years not thinking about List or programming in it or doing anything about it. Uh, an opportunity came up. Suddenly, I feel like a little bit like Rick Van Winkle. You know that reference. Wake up and suddenly there are common people who think Common List is old. This talk is about what Medley is. With some demos, we are what we're doing, why we're doing it, and to give a pitch for some help. I've asked my uh, friends, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves just in case you have to chime in. So, anyway, I started out uh, many, many years ago, uh, came to park with Danny and, uh, and Warren at that time. I'm actually, uh, most of my work is in computational linguistics and the theory of, of grammar, but I got sucked in early in terms of uh, building models of language inside LISP and InterLISP. And I became an implementer uh, over time, kind of sharing my kind of academic uh, linguistic work with my pedal to the metal, building a race space work. And I have went off and did startups and I was at Amazon, I was at Microsoft and uh, came back to begin to use InterLISP again a couple of years ago, originally just to do validation of some theorems we were proving on the language side, on the linguistic side. But now I'm sucked in again, and I'm doing the text editor. So that's me. Sure. Hi, I'm Herb Jelinek. I started with the group in the early 80s when I was not much more than a child and uh, wrote a bunch of um, pieces of Interlisp, uh, the file browser among them, and worked on the common Lisp uh, integration, mostly on the file system side. But academically, I was also sort of split and interested in user interface research and eventually left the group to do that at Park, still in Lisp, and always stayed in touch with, uh, with these guys. Um, subsequently, I was an original member of the Java project at uh, Sun and did some startups. And now I work developing software for game developers at Sony PlayStation. Yeah, I'm Frank Halas. I uh, was a member of the Park Group in the 1980s, I guess. I was primarily working on a project called Note Cards which was a very early hypertext system before the web was hypertext or before the web. And uh, it was all implemented in Interlist D. And uh, when I, I left Park in the early 90s, I uh, went on to do a bunch of other stuff. And uh, after I retired, I came back to uh, working on this Interlist project because Larry asked me to revive note cards on top of Interlist, which I've done about 90% of. And then like Ron, I got sucked in. <laughs> and uh, right now on the Interlisp project, I, I developed uh, Interlisp Online, which we'll talk about later, where I put uh, Interlisp onto uh, available through a, a web browser anywhere. Uh, and I'm also working on all the uh, installers to install Interlisp easily on Macs and Windows PCs and Linux. And uh, when I'm done with that, I'll get back to uh, completely reviving note cards and getting it to run on Interlisp. Uh, I'm Steve Keisler. Uh, I got involved with LISP at a three-letter government agency in Washington, uh, Interlisp uh, 370, it was called, uh, for the IBM 370 series. And then I went to DARPA later, and uh, I sponsored a couple of applications in Interlisp. And I had a D machine in my office at the time. 
Uh, and then I sort of wandered away to common list because uh, I couldn't buy interlist and uh, developed some applications and also sponsor uh, did a lot of other work. And uh, I discovered uh, I also wrote a book back in 85 on interlist, the language and its usage. That was for interlist uh, 10 and interlist, interlist 370. Then uh, I discovered Larry a couple of years ago in an email. And so I volunteered and I've uh, completed two books on uh, tools and utilities and interactive parts of interlist based on interlist D. And now I'm working on trying to get loops running and uh, testing it and making and writing a new version of a book on it. Hi, I'm Arun Welch. I got into Interlisp uh, back in the round 84. I was at Ohio State at the time, and we'd gotten a grant of a number of uh, D machines, and I was supporting them, and I was supporting the users group, and then I ended up working for all the various entities that were selling Interlisp through their life cycles. Most of my work was in uh, uh, supporting uh, CLOS and uh, the network stack and uh, a bunch of other things. And then as with everybody else, left it in the mid nineties and then got roped into it again. So what is Medley Interlisp? It is the software for the Xerox list machines developed from the late 1960s at Bo Baranek and Newman, where Ron was and Warren and Danny. Through the seventies and the eighties until the Mid 80s, we went through transfer to a company called Invos, and then uh, the 90s to a company called Venue, and then went through uh, the abandoned wear phrase. 1992, ACM Software System Award was given to the Interl to Interlist for pioneering work in programming environments. And they called out the features of structure editing, source code management, code analysis and cross-referencing combined to support rapid, rapid incremental development. And you might wonder what those things really meant if you didn't actually have the opportunity to use it. And so part of the reason for wanting to revive this is that, you know, this stuff I worked on, you read about it, but reading about something is different than experiencing it. And so the, the goal here is not to create an artif historical artifact that people just can look at. Uh, but to let people use the system in the way that it was intended. And if it happens that machines today are a thousand times faster than machines in, well, so much the better. It doesn't degrade from the idea being expressed. So um, now you can see it and to make the merit. And, and uh, I've been working with the Software Preservation Network to try and bring our experience in reviving software to be a conventional process. I know the Computer History Museum has talked about how they have software available for download, but not for really trying it out and seeing what it really does. So I'm gonna skip into demos before talking about it more. The first concept to show is how a residential environment supports incremental development. By residential environment, and it was a, phrase, I think, Eric Sandoval. The idea is that you operate in the live environment. You debug, edit, define things in the environment. You can write out files to save things for future loads, but it's all, a, but you never edit the text. The text is just a way of looking at it and a way of saving it for future use. But you edit, you load it in, you edit the structure and save it out. And the system tracks what changes, but it means that you can do things like not, you can start running in a program that you haven't finished. And when you get to a function call that you haven't defined, it will open up a break window, you can define it and go on. And similarly, when you have an error, you can get a break, it opens up a window, you look back on the stack, you can look at all of the variables and values, you can fix the error, possibly unwind the stack if you need to and keep on going. And this shortens the development cycle. And uh, the primary goal for our research was to support researchers who were not doing programming to build a system to a specification. They were trying to figure out what, the, they didn't know before they sat down to write the, the system exactly what the outcome would be. Not programming to specification, as it is conventionally meant. And so 
the fact that there weren't a lot of safety belts, there wasn't a way of guaranteeing the program was correct, was okay because you hadn't even finished it. You hadn't even specified it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's yeah, not entirely yeah. sure what you would do, what you're doing. So um, one of the features that is uh, somewhat misappropriately maligned is DWIM, do what I mean. And spelling correction is an important part of DWIM. If you have a commonly, but other things are as well. So if you have a file name and you say open the file and the file isn't where you said it was, it might look around for another file and ask you if you want that other one instead before giving you an error. So here I will, uh, Ron wrote me something that would do this when I clicked on the, on the uh, example, but I wasn't brave enough to install it. So here I misspelled I I miss plus, but you're not supposed to know that. And I ended the expression with a right angle, right square bracket, which is a super parenthesis. Basically says close all open parentheses. So one of the things people don't like about Lisp is all the parentheses. And I tell you that you never have to count parentheses and enter Lisp. So now I've defined this function. I can, uh, I'll just type it in. All right, so it's still there. I call foo one of six. It asked me, ooh, plus in foo one, should that be plus? And I can say no, and it gives me an error. We try, and this goes ahead and computes 12. Now if I print out the one again, and you see that it's corrected it in the source code. It also automatically timestamps the function that was edited by me. We had a lot of these uh, files with the historic edit dates. It's that we went out of our way to preserve them now. So you can see with certain parts of the system that were last touched in 1970 something. So then the, the, there's history. So the list system maintains a history of all the commands you've typed and all of their results not necessarily of any printout that comes out of it. But usually when you're debugging lists, you don't print things on the terminal except for warning messages or, and you can reach back in the history and say redo or fix or retry any previous command by either giving it its number or relative to some other event or, you know, I'll, I'll use this from, from time to time. Um, and, uh, you can see this is me preparing for the talk. And uh, let me just exit that. So uh, you know, the events that have who won in them. All right, so event 147. All right, so PP who won. Undo 147. And so the error goes comes back. The, even if you make it, if you make an error, making it correcting an error, uh, you can undo that. And uh, Interlist was the first system to really to have a undo at all, or to have a TypeScript, for that matter. Uh, Unix Bill Mashi imported the Interlist history mechanism into Unix. The file manager is a bunch of different little utilities around the system that track when things, your program elements and definitions have changed in a way that you would want to write them out again. You want to save your state of your program. It was called the file package back when packages didn't have a meaning from common list. So now we call it the file manager sometimes. And uh, that has this primitive, if you, if you, you say files, that tells you what things need to be saved. Function foo is to be saved or dumped. Do you want to say where it goes? And I'll say yes. And I'll say, let go on file C. And it says create a new file, file C. 
Yes. Right, and now if I do files again, it says file B, file C needs to is changed to its variables, file comms. The file comms are the, man, the manifest for a file is a variable. It tells you what's in it and it controls the process of making it out, making a new file uh, and figuring out where something is. So I could ask, where is who one? And it will tell me it's on file C. And where is, where is? And it's on the file package file. Who is on file package? And those are all of the things that are defined in that file. I didn't actually realize that you could use the, the master scope query language for querying the file package. It's much more convenient than the functions, which really leads me to, I was going to show this, uh, but I won't spend a lot of time on it, interactive. So Interlist was one of the first systems to ever have online manual of system for Unix and man pages. So if I say man in file, you get to ask me a window for the interlist reference manual, which I can uh, also access through this graphical user interface. of the hierarchy of the... One of the features of Interlist was this easy interactive graphics, especially around graphs. And we use that in a lot of things. So if I had said, say, uh, man, CL with open file, what does it do? It brings up a web page. So this is the new feature that isn't part of the D machines that we added because I uh, I didn't remember it as common list as well as I remembered interlist. And I needed to look up things in the manuals. It was easier, easier to add this as a feature than to try and struggle with it. So master scope, I've given several uh, examples of it before, but uh, I don't need to load helps us because everything is loaded. Analyze. If you wanted to analyze something and you haven't already, then you can use the analyze on helpsys. And that goes through and records all the relationships between this function and every other, anything that it calls, every variable it uses, every property it accesses. As, uh, and then you can show where any calls CLHS set up. So this says, show where any calls something. Show where is the command. Then there's a noun phrase, a verb, and a noun phrase. And it, and it shows you every instance of that verb relationship between the quantifiers. But well, anyway, it's cool. I want to talk a little bit about common list and interlist integration. We had interlist the language, which is really kind of a misnomer. Just like common list, the language is a misnomer. The language of common list was very small. And it's mainly a huge set of libraries in that language. And uh, interlist was not so different for a variety of ways. Sometimes it calls things differently. But in common list and interlist, all of the data types are common. There's no difference between, there's not a interlist symbol and a common list symbol, there's a symbol and arrays and strings and structures and numbers. And this meant extending each dialect a little, each language, each uh, a little bit. And the, probably the hardest thing to retrofit onto common list is the spaghetti stack notion where the stack pointers are almost first class objects. You can't quite make them, they behave differently with the garbage collector but um, that lets you write a debugger that reaches back in the stack and evaluates a variable as of the control stack and the value stack can be different in spaghetti stacks. Many functions and special forms are the same and are shadow imported from one package to the other uh, so that 
power con at you know, different levels. And some are slightly different. CL of L is different from IL of L. If there's a free variable in common lisp, it's an error in inter lisp. It's just assumed to be dynamic. Not a lot of other things. CL lambda is different from IL lambda in that from the common list point of view, every interlist function is uh, ampersand optional and rest ignore. Uh, but fortunately, the common list standard doesn't require that you error check that. Uh, it doesn't interpret it, but not what it is. So basically, extended common list to include interlist and interlist to include common list. And the common list definitions and declarations are managed by the interlist environment. So I can open up, the, we, for online and for, for a lot of people who got confused, we have an interlist exec, which is what is called in modern speak, the REPL. I had never heard of a REPL until, the, what are you talking about, the REPL? Oh, the read about print book. Said, well, we read, and then sometimes we decide it's a command. And some, uh, so the commands that I've been typing are all part of the REPL, or the, the, the exec was, is because that's what 10x called it. Anyway, the definitions to manage by the interlist environment. And uh, I can do uh, edit where any on helps is false field with. Ron got into this, got me into this habit of using common list when macro instead of if then of interlist. But you can intermix them however you want, and, or you stay in one, one thing. If you look in um, S edit, it was written in, with packages in a way that would translate more readily to a common list environment. And uh, lots of people seem to have done that. And of course, the CLOS implementation is not it's just done in common style. So here, you know, it says with CL when I can uh, expand that, and it turns it into a con. I haven't been showing off the structure editor, but so structure editors. There are actually three structure editors, one of which was written, I think, originally in the late 60s by Peter Deutsch, which is the teletype oriented use. It is edit mode teletype. And you were working on a teletype or an equivalent machine, you had only paper IO. It would print your I, you would type it in, it would print it. it little, I, we used a TRS 80 for a while. It's eight lines of uh, 80 characters says the display. It's a little bit like trying to drive with it in a tank looking through the slit. That's how it felt with the tele, the structure editor. You write really big complicated functions by descending and keeping track in your mind of where things were. But it's still useful today, especially for, because it's programmatic. I can say uh, edit where any calls CLN and uh, uh, Edit where any is when dash get the it is done having expanded the one location. I you know and so now it says the function file C needs to be dumped and helps us change the repo lookup. So they do I do undo edit. It doesn't need to be thumped out again. So now next the virtual machine and the operating system. So in the D machines there was microcode to intrude a bytecoded instruction set. Peter Deutsch wrote a paper called Very Compact, uh, well, I forget what it was called, Designing Something to be Compact to Run Lisp, because the problem with the Alto Lisp on the Xerox Alto was that there wasn't enough memory, and virtual memory was all right, but the programs were, needed to be 
small enough that you could still fit it into the available working space. And I worked on that out of this. At the time, you had to, if you had a personal computer, you had to name your computer. And uh, so one fellow named his computer Gazunda because it goes under the desk. And I called mine Maytag because it remembered, resembled the washing machine on spin cycle, the seeking the hell. So, uh, and that might be interesting for people even today. The microcode was ported to C, but the emulate, the, it, it, so there's a virtual machine that has never been a real machine that you're emulating. It's a virtual machine. You call it a Lisp machine because you're writing microcode for the Lisp instruction set. Uh, so I can do things like uh, inspect code. And then notices which uh, symbols it had, and then it pushes on the stack. Does it just jump of the stack? It's true or nil. Return push a variable. Copy that to the top of the stack. Push it is constant. Just you know that you, you can see you can use that for debugging. You can, but um, so the memory images were portable from machine to machine. The, what we called the sysouts because that was the name of the operation someone made for it. So the, the machine, the, between the D machines, the images were portable, the sysouts. But also there was a time when you could move from Maiko. The emulator in C was called Maiko by its Fuji Xerox engineers. And then they came out to Park and worked with us on getting the first release out of the interlist running on a Sun workstation. Now you can rely on the house. I would say more. So now um, for something completely different. Ron, why don't you introduce this subject and why you did it? And well, this is part of a general thrust of modernizing the environment. Uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about you know the mouse, the clipboard, and all these things that didn't exist. The wheel mouse and so forth that didn't exist in the in the early days. And so how do you make this kind of old environment functional for people that are really used to the way Windows and so forth work today? And the same thing has to do with uh, files and repositories and the way you keep track in the larger environment of uh, the state of the system and multiple people working on the system and so forth. And Git obviously is the kind of way that people today operate in that way in terms of change tracking and so forth. So um, the question then is, you know, Medley has its own way of managing its files, managing definitions, uh, archiving the definitions on files, and it has its own ver version file system for the local environment. But how do you connect that up to uh, people working on different machines and making updates and wanting testing of pull requests and so forth uh, in the model that Git presents? So the question was, could you extend Medley so into Git so that Git becomes not a repository of files, but a repository of definitions? So um, conventionally, obviously, Git tracks and compares files and in doing that, when you do change detection and the presentation of changes, you're based on line editing semantics. If you have a mismatching character sequence, that's a significant difference that gets highlighted uh, in, in the diff. Even though in terms of Lisp semantics, the fact that something is on one line or a parenthesis moved from one place to another, or a super parenthesis got introduced, those are semantically meaningless differences. So question is, uh, how do you migrate into the Git world the idea that in Medley you're really operating on individual definitions? Uh, so Medley source files then become, uh, as we've seen, the external archives for structured definitions with metadata of various sorts, when things were created, when the file was created, what changed on the file, and so forth. And what happens with those files that you save and you load them you, maybe you print them, but you never edit them. If you start editing a Medley source file, you screw up all the metadata. And on those files, a given definition can be represented in different but semantically equivalent line and character sequences. 
So what we did was to provide, provide an interface to GIF from inside Medley that provides for definition-based change tracking. So for example, there's a command PRC for pull request compare, uh, and we'll do a demo of that, that basically operates to retrieve change files from the repository to copy them into temporary local space from which it can find and parse the definitions that have changed between that branch of the pull request and the master, and then compare not line by line, but compare the structures. You know, Larry, why don't you just do a, you know, just do a PRC command. So uh, the simplest one I thought was the edit by initials, just to kind of give the flavor. So, so what that did there was it, it went to Git and brought up, a, found all the pull requests that are out there and produced a menu of them, uh, found which files between that particular PR and the master had changed, brought those files locally, and is now putting up a menu. Uh, so click on that, let bring it up. And it says, in fact, the pretty print file was the only file that had changed between the origin master and the origin edit by initials branch. And it gives you commands. So uh, one of the commands is compare. So click on the file, the pretty. The LCOM is the compiled file, by the way, that also changed. And so what it did was, was looked at uh, the two versions of that file, and it found that the only function that had changed was print date one. And it gives you an abbreviated structure-based difference that says that uh, whenever you see the, the, a number, that means that there's a sequence of things that haven't changed, expressions that haven't changed, not lines. And then it highlights where the differences are. Now, if you click on that particular function, then it brings up a little menu of places where the actual changes appear. And so if you click on the bottom, one of those bottom ones, it brings up that particular function. And now you have to scroll a little bit or lift up the window, uh, not that window, lift up, the, lift up the single window that says print date one. Click in the title bar and lift it up. So it dragged the other windows with it, okay? And now what you see is the highlight of the particular changes particular positions within this file where there are structural changes. So you see what got added there was uh, if initials, then do something and otherwise do the if changes. So what this change uh, is all about is putting in metadata in a file that when somebody makes a file, at the top of the file, it says what functions were changed, but it would also be nice to know who made the file. So that change puts out the, uh, not only when it was edited, when the file was changed, but who changed it, sort of a, a blame backtrace. So that's sort of the simplest example. Of course, you know, if you picked another PRC that had a lot of other changes, then you would see a menu of more files, and uh, each of those files would have variables that changed, or functions that changed, or record declarations that changed, or whatever it is. And again, you could inspect each of those independently. So the idea, again, is uh, to provide some simple commands that let you see Git as if it was part of the Medley residential environment. Now, eventually, and this is sort of on my list, is to set it up so that uh, not only can you do the compare, but you can actually load different versions from different commits of the same function, compare them in the structure editor, shift code from one to the other, move one into active you know, runtime status so you can see what it did, leaving everything else the same, and compare and contrast the behaviors in the runtime environment. So if you had a function foo that was defined differently in commits C and D, you'd be looking at foo C and foo D, and they're both co-resident. You can operate 
uh, you will be able to operate a small matter of programming in the same environment, same residential environment of uh, different versions of the same function that you can now manipulate and manage, undo, redo, and all that kind of stuff. So that's sort of the idea of letting you think that Medley is sitting on top of Git. So that's that sequence. So who's involved? You've met a lot of the people. I wanted to thank people who were willing to listen to me practice this talk. Thanks to all the people who have contributed to the Angelus revival in one way or another talk prep. And in memoriam, since uh, Danny and Warren and John Zabowski and Steve Purcell aren't with us. So a little bit about what we've been doing is and our need to do in the future. This adaptation to the current modern context, you might not think it was significant, but it, it's really a pain. The keyboards have changed in ways that are exacerbated by a little bit of the history of Interlisp having to deal with multiple kinds of devices that had Japanese typing added to it at one point. And then all kinds of Sun 3 keyboards. The keyboard, the peripherals, the UI peripherals are our big pain. We've made great progress in some areas, but not much in keyboard. This was a, a users expect arrow keys. The mice today are different. We, we had middle mouse buttons that worked easily, and now they're very awkward to use. And so when I want to change a menu, anyway, well, that's a problem we need to worry about. Display, they are much higher resolution and color, and they change sizes readily. And we haven't, we can deal with the sizes. It was a version of Medley that ran in color at one time, but we haven't, we have to do some investigation. In some cases, we're doing software archaeology. We did not get a clean release medley. The latest version of medley it was under development, and then development kind of petered off. And the changes that were made were valuable enough that we wanted them, especially around portability to other devices and uh, change in the address space by a factor, four more bits of address space, which was really significant. So. Converting to be in the 90s, they did the work on the D machines and the Spark are big Indian, but machines today and operating systems are pretty much little Indian. And so the code has to byte swap if you're on a little Indian machine and not if you're on a big Indian machine. For portability, we've been keeping the big Indian version alive. And so that's a source of confusion and then going to 64 bit. Anyway, the, the work here has been to make the emulator run in standard C when it was written for Kernigan and Plauger's C you know, 30 years ago. Oh, and there have been uh, about 400 commits or more. And uh, network, there are a number of interesting applications that use the network that was available at the time, which predated ARPANET and internet, not ARPANET, predated internet. And, and uh, so we have networking code in three protocol stacks. We have PUP, the Park Universal Packet Network System, XNS, the Xerox Network System, and TCP IP. And those need some revival. There's a uh, Someone who built an XNS emulator for the D machines that he called Dodo as a flightless extinct bird. But uh, it's pretty cool to be able to run filing and clearinghouse and, and uh, gives you bragging rights in the history of the internet forums. Unicode, Medley supported full Japanese Chinese character sets using the Xerox network system, the Xerox character code standard. And, and Ron has put in an enormous amount of work converting the system to be external format agnostic. That is, you have external formats in either XSCCS or UTF-8, and it translates automatically 
and the UI guidelines, clipboard. What, I'm, what I wanted to say was that there is some judgment necessary not to go whole hog to reduce, to remove the charm of the old user interface. Some people enjoy, so I th think we, we have to, we have to segregate or at least apply some judgment about what things we really are necessary or showstoppers to fix and what things are just personal preference. We've, I'd like to leave it so that you can get the old user interface if you load in, if you don't load the, the, the changes. I'd say that any piece of software that you wanted to port from 30 years ago would have to resolve these issues. They might have different problems, but these are important issues that as we are, uh, I'm hoping that we can provide some guidance to others engaged in a similar effort uh, that uh, is trying to keep this in mind. Other ongoing activities, relearning how Medley works. So after 30 years, I'm really shocked at how much I remember, which is maybe half of what I need to. But uh, I suppose that working on a code base for over 10 years does turn into muscle memory. But it still takes some refreshing and then learning new tools that the things that I never had to touch in my career, I was mainly working on web standards and standard strategy for Adobe and metadata. So Docker and Git and so on. Fixing bugs, fixing bugs. There's still Y2K problems. I found one just the other day. It wasn't significant, but it's the part. Maybe could I fix it here? And three, zero. Last edited by me in December of 1982 says print in a way that it goes onto the history list. And then it computes the last character of the date. And if it's even, then it, uh, anyway, uh, it, it's trying to decide whether or not to say you're working late tonight by looking at your good morning or good afternoon or good evening. And it said it always greets you with hello. So there's a bug in this part of the system, but Many people, you know, the first time that Medley said it to me, happy Valentine's Day, it felt like getting a Valentine from an old friend from 30 years before. It also is really inappropriate. It doesn't say happy President's Day. It's Lincoln's like spirit in Washington's birthday, Victoria Day and Canada Day and Guy Fawkes Day. All right, where are we now? So uh, completing works in progress, the things that the port didn't finish, gathering, re reviewing and updating documentation, which is a big deal. Lowering barriers to entry videos, screenshots, installers and online. So here's how hard it is to get medley. You go to online.interlist.org. And then it wants you to log in. I'll log in as me. And uh, I'll start. So let, uh, let me explain what you're seeing here. This is a, a, a complete version of Medley running through any uh, modern web browser. So you can experiment with Medley online without ever have to installing it. Uh, on your machine. We do save uh, files between sessions. Uh, if you're a logged in user, there's also a guest mode where you can log in as guests and we don't save any files between, between sessions. Uh, but if you're a logged in user, you can treat it almost as if it was on your desk machine, on your desktop uh, with one uh, or a couple of small issues where the browser absorbs keys that are meaningful in uh, Interlisp. Uh, but aside from that, um, it runs just like it's on your desktop. So what you're seeing here, what you're seeing here is running online. Larry was showing before is running on a Windows machine on his desktop. And as much as possible, we're trying to make those identical. So the issue uh, of interest is how, how did we accomplish this? We wanted to get Medley running in a browser so that we could 
make the access to it much more prevalent, much easier, lower the barrier of entry. One thing we thought of uh, was to make it run, uh, to, to take the MICO code, the underlying virtual machine, and port it to either JavaScript or WebAssembly and actually have Medley run in your browser. This is what uh, the Smalltalk people have done. If any of you have seen the Smalltalk Zoo, they managed to take their virtual machine, uh, re-implement it in JavaScript, and all of the Smalltalk uh, environment will run within your browser. I guess uh, we have a, a Myco is a, a lot more complicated and, and uh, what should I say, uh, uh, ramshackle than the virtual machine that uh, underlies Smalltalk. So that project looks undoable to us, at least to start with. So we took a different approach, which was to run Medley in a Docker container on uh, AWS in this case, although it could run anywhere. So the architecture of the whole thing is we have a, a, a web portal written in Node, uh, which does all the login and registration and allows you to press a button called Run Medley, which loads into your browser uh, this wonderful piece of software called No VNC, which implements a VNC a virtual uh, desktop across in a browser using WebSockets. So the web portal will just, for each user, will just start a Docker container. The Docker container runs Medley. Medley uh, displays onto XVNC, and then no VNC will display what's on that XVNC screen on your screen. And uh, we, you know, we keep the file, your file system from the Docker container, we keep on, a, you know, on an AWS volume. There's a couple more pieces here, the registration database and so on, but this is the basic idea that what you're doing when you run Medley online is you're just running a Medley on AWS and using no VNC to display the remote content on your screen. So help wanted. So I wanted to give this talk out of the Bay Area List Group. It would be great to get some common list experts involved in helping test their common list implementation because a lot of it got done after I left the project. And I don't know uh, a lot about either what's, what's in it or how good it is. But there are a lot of things that don't require skills other than, that require skills other than debugging list code. We've been collecting a bibliography about papers, about interlist papers, about projects written in interlist, about related work and some the evaluation of systems and so on. Um, but um, that needs some cleanup, testing the implementation, product management for an open source project, which we are, documentation. We have a lot of documentation, but we're not, it was cataloged different than the bibliography because we, ha we have the documents and they're, they were copyright venue or licensed. And since so we, we can release them without worrying about copyright. Uh, list users is, is user contributed files. We need to sort them. We're having some luck with um, a intrepid pioneer from, from Milan, Paolo, who's been doing screenshots of lots of things. It's really remarkably great. You know, all of the screen backgrounds from here, it's the high Paolo. Benchmarks, I only ran one benchmark here, so on. Uh, we'd like to get emulators for older versions of Medley, just first to keep us honest, second to show people that, you know, it isn't a, the choice between modernizing and showing the historically accurate list system is not as a false dichotomy. You know both, uh, and that would means I don't have to w w worry about breaking that. There are uh, besides the Software Preservation Network, the Computer History Museum, and the Internet Archive are both organizations that do other kinds of software restoration, and that I'd like just like to offer them what they need out of the project. Video demo help wanted had it on the slide, but uh, I don't know if you're interested. We are, uh, we have incorporated a 501c3 
and can accept deductions that are tax deductible. We don't have a lot, but we'll pay for it. We're looking for so sustainability in making the payments for AWS and so on. You get a pretty good discount because we're a nonprofit, but still, I think our, our usage is going to go up and we might need to invest in Kubernetes or something. If we're lucky, we'll have money. So, uh, and go to our GitHub repo sponsors page for that.